Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. In 2020, the U.S. imposed its harshest sanctions on Syria to date. The Caesar sanctions explicitly target Syria's reconstruction, making rebuilding from 10 years of war close to impossible. Well, now a top UN expert is calling for these sanctions to be lifted. In a statement, the UN Special Rapporteur on Sanctions said, quote, the sanctions violate the human rights of the Syrian people whose country has been destroyed by almost 10 years of ongoing conflict. Elena F. Dohan joins me now. She is the UN Special Rapporteur on Sanctions and a professor at Belarusian State University. Professor Dohan, welcome to Pushback. It's a pleasure. So what prompted you to put out this statement? Well, my intention was to bring attention to the point that imposition of unilateral sanctions in the contemporary world is affecting human rights of those who, which, whose rights it generally is announced to seek to protect. And as a result, the scope of human rights violated by application not only of Caesar Act sanctions, but by many other types of sanctions. And uh, for example, in the situation of Syria, we can't identify the impact of the Caesar Act sanctions only because there is a scope of them applied today. So the impact of these sanctions is enormous, both to Syria and as well as on any other states. It's necessary to take into account today that the very notion of unilateral sanctions we hear about every day is in expanding a lot. We used to hear about the idea of targeted sanctions, which target only bad guys. But if we will look at the concept of sanctions, we will see that that's absolutely different from what is said. A number of sanctions have a sort of uh, sectoral character and as a result are really equivalent to the economic sanctions in general. When we speak, for example, about the situation in Syria, it's not possible in accordance, so the Caesar Act itself seeks to prevent the reconstruction works in Syria. And as we know, after 10 years of the conflict, a lot of buildings, including social infrastructure like hospitals or schools or housing are destroyed at all and uh, people have no place to live in. Moreover, when we speak about the economic situation, there are lots of people in Syria live in poverty. And if the economic in this uh, system in the, sanction, uh, in the sanctioned state can't restart functioning normally, the population itself becomes very much dependent on the delivery of humanitarian aid and the society doesn't develop. The, as a result, the prices at the black market are increasing, there are no sufficient goods and uh, people have no works and they have no money to pay for. Moreover, in the contemporary situation, due to the scope of sanctions imposed to Syria, it's not possible to transfer money to Syria directly, especially after the Syrian Central Bank has been lift, listed. Even if there are any attempts to transfer money via some other agents, agents start to be scared because of the fear of secondary sanctions as uh, actors uh, cooperating with Syrian government or, or already sanctioned institutions. More, more, uh, moreover, less and less humanitarian organizations are able to do their humanitarian work as they used to do before, again, because of the fear of secondary sanctions. Donors are scared to provide money or any other goods to be delivered to Syria because they, again, are scared to fall under secondary sanctions for doing this humanitarian part. Again, when we speak about the scope of sanctions, we need to take into account that the new forms appear. And here I speak, for example, about the application of so-called cyber sanctions. As when we speak about the situation in Syria, it basically means that due to the limitation on delivery of goods, Syrian government was unable to buy software for CT scanners, which is very important in the course of the pandemic. Again, as far due to the limitations in the course of the pandemic, lots of people were not able to go to school and lots of people couldn't get necessary medical aid. However, again, due to the sanctions imposed towards Syria, Syrian citizens as well as Syrian doctors can't use Zoom for communication. It directly sat in the Zoom license agreement 
that citizens of Syria are not allowed to use this means. Again, uh, Syrian doctors can't use other open access software for distant uh, diagnosis or distant treatment, and there are not, no sufficient doctors in the country. And moreover, Syrian uh, doctors have complained about the impossibility to use the medical open access resource PubMed for consultations as concerned the treatment of COVID as well as other decisions. Uh, other diseases in the cause of sanctions. There was an article in the American Prospect in September. It was headlined, From the U.S. to Syria, a doctor smuggles life-saving equipment. A doctor having to smuggle into his own country, into Syria, parts to fix a broken CT scanner. As part of your uh, investigation into the impact of, of these sanctions, can you talk more about that? It's just the, the impact on a narrow issue such as medical equipment. Indeed, that's one of the very serious problems today. Due to the limitations on delivery of different sorts of goods to Syria, uh, quite a huge number of goods are identified as so-called dual use goods. Sometimes it comes to the points which seems to be ridiculous for an ordinary person. For example, toothpaste can't be delivered to Syria because it's considered to be a dual use good. When it comes to the medicine, there are serious limitations on the possibility of Syrian government to, be, uh, to buy medicine, protective kits and medical equipment. In, at the, Begin, uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, that was around April, May 2020, Syrian government and Syrian doctors were able to do only 100 tests per day because there was no possibility to buy these tests. Secondly, uh, to be able to, uh, to get any medicine or medical equipment as a sort of humanitarian aid, the delivers of humanitarian aid, including humanitarian organizations, are obliged to get a necessary license from the sanctioning countries. I had an expert consultations with a huge number of humanitarian NGOs, mostly faith-based NGOs, were trying to deliver humanitarian aid to Syria, and they were unanimous about the fact that getting these licenses and getting these permissions is a very lengthy, costly, and complicated process. They also complete even when they try to deliver a medical equipment, they have to prove the general humanitarian aim uh, for, for delivery, even if we speak about, for example, the COVID test or about the CT scanners or any other types of medicines. As a result, small humanitarian NGOs prefer not to be involved in the delivery of this humanitarian aid at all because they do not have lawyers who will deal with the process and who will be able, uh, and the organizations themselves are not able to pay for going through the process. Again, when, for example, the permission is received to deliver humanitarian aid to Syria, it doesn't mean that if organization brings it across the border, the organization is allowed, for example, to buy fuel for its car to deliver necessary medicine or medical equipment. It will mean that the organization will need another permission to get fuel for a single car in the process of delivery of humanitarian aid. Some other humanitarian organizations have complained, for example, that because of their humanitarian work aimed to deliver medicine, medicine, medical equipment and food to Syria in the course of the pandemic, their bank's account have been frozen as well as their personal bank, uh, the bank accounts of their personal have been frozen. So they basically fought under secondary section, sanctions as a result. Some other of them say that due to this fact, they try to transfer money uh, through around, for example, Lebanon, uh, in order to buy some sort of goods in Syria. But if you buy goods in Syria, it doesn't it mean that no more medicine or medical equipment is coming Syria, into Syria? Moreover, naturally, the prices in Syria are quite often regulated by the black market prices. Therefore, as I could verify, not only uh, so information received not only from the Syrian government, uh, 
which provided a very detailed one when I prepared a report to the General Assembly uh, as concerned the humanitarian impact of sanctions in the cause of the pandemic, but also the unanimous voices of humanitarian organizations. There, are, there is a severe shortage of medical equipment and they name sanctions as the main impediment in the process of delivery of food, medicine and medical equipment in Syria. You mentioned earlier the term dual use, which is a just to clarify a term under uh, in sanctions discourse. It, it means uh, a good that could have both a civilian and potential military purpose. So did I hear you correctly that toothpaste has been de has been designated in Syria as dual use? That's what has been reported by humanitarian organizations. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um the, uh, the, the Caesar Act itself, I want to quote from it, the U.S. Caesar Act, where it lays out its explicit strategy. It says that its strategy is, to, quote, to deter foreign persons from entering into contracts related to reconstruction in the areas that it outlines. And those areas are the government controlled areas where most Syrians live. Can you talk more about how it works on the local level where how this act itself by one country, by the U.S., then pretty much deters the rest of the world from helping Syria rebuild. Yes, indeed. Unfortunately, the, one of the processes which we face today in the field of sanctions is the expanded application of secondary sanctions by the United States. And these sanctions quite often, as it takes place, for example, in the case of Syria Act, are applied extraterritorially. That's quite evident, for example, on the point that the European Union is very much against this policy. If you look at the guidances on the delivery of humanitarian aid issued by the European Union at the end, at the beginning of December, they say explicitly that the European Union is strictly against extraterritorial application of sanctions as well as against application of secondary sanctions. That's, uh, my, I align myself with that uh, point. From the point of international law, there is nothing which can allow states to apply extraterritorially its jurisdiction over someone else and sanctioning someone for getting into trade, someone third country national from getting into trade with someone else who is already sanctioned. Uh, that's why we have to mention here two aspects, first of all. A person is punished upon the decision of the executive power of another state without any due process guarantee, without any accusation in accordance with the rule of law, for doing something which may quite often doesn't even constitute a crime. In the majority of the cases, that's exactly the case. And as a result, no, it's very easy to include someone in the list. And as a result, people start to scare. One of the main messages which have been set by the humanitarian organizations during that expert consultations I had in October was the following. The fear of sanctions, they say, today harm even more than the sanctions themselves. Everyone is scared to be included tomorrow or in two days into the list because they have dealt with their own person or their own country, like that's exactly the case of Syria. Donors, humanitarian organizations, banks themselves, any trade partners, anyone who is or will be able to be involved into any engineering or reconstruction process, as it's said in Syria Act, are scared because they may have other businesses, they do some humanitarian work or do anything else. And unfortunately, in the contemporary situation, there is not a single mechanism for them to apply for delisting in accordance with the due process standards, no access to justice in this situation. So that's one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that because of that general fear of everyone, donors, states, humanitarian organizations, countries, companies, and anyone else, the population of the targeted country is suffering a lot. That's namely Syrian people 
which doesn't get necessary humanitarian aid. That's Syrian people who live in the under the destroyed houses or somewhere else because the, the reconstruction process is not ongoing. That's Syrian people who can't get medical treatment, food, who can't go to school or even use Zoom for any sort of educational processes or any sort of uh, at least getting information about what's happening in the world. I want to quote you from a article in the New Yorker from April 2020. It's called America's Abandonment of Syria. And it says, even though the State Department and USAID no longer have personnel in Syria, they still determine how the majority of foreign funding is spent there. And the article goes on to quote a senior humanitarian officer who says, quote, it's become a collective consensus among donors that we will not do reconstruction in Syria. Reconstruction is a dirty word, this senior humanitarian officer said. Professor Dohan, is this your sense as well, that reconstruction in Syria has basically become a dirty word? I would say that the, uh, I would come again to the point of fear. Because of the fear, everyone is very scared to be involved into any reconstruction processes as well as at any other processes, which as a result affects the human rights and I would say even human lives in Syria a lot. Because if any of us gets sick, everyone is vulnerable today in the face of the pandemic or in the face of other diseases. If you have no hospitals, if you have no medical equipment, no doctors and no medicine, your chances to die are much higher than for those who have it. And I would say that that basically results in a sort of discrimination toward the people of targeted countries, how it takes place in Syria. They do not get medical treatment. They do not get the housing. They do not get sufficient food and that endangered their lives a lot. And you mentioned this earlier, but I want to ask you to talk more about it. So the U.S. Treasury has designated the Syrian Central Bank as being possibly involved in money laundering. What is the impact of that on Syrian civilians? I will answer here probably in two aspects. The very first one, that the very possibility of the, U of the organ of one state to designate some an, an organ or a bank in another state as being possibly involved into money laundering or any other processes is very dubious from the point of international law. Moreover, no one has, uh, let's say, it's possible to make any statements, but the law doesn't function in this way. The law is based on the rule of law. That's why, upon my opinion, the very designation in this case is absolutely illegal. When we speak about the impact of, uh, on the lives of people in this situation, I would say that in this situation, it generally closes the possibility, uh, make the possibilities of Syrian population to reconstruct the society as well as to get any humanitarian aid even uh, smaller than it was before. As I said, one of the very scary developments in this field of sanctions is the development of so-called secondary sanctions. By designating the Syria Central Bank, as well as a number of other banks, the, uh, because of the fact that the US dollars is used for payments a lot first, the system is controlled by the US a lot. And because of all this general fear, no donor, no company, will be ready to communicate to the Syrian bank or any other bank of Syria, and therefore no payment may be made. No money transfer for whatever humanitarian purposes may be made. And that will mean that people, even they have job, which has some sort of international aspect, won't be paid if the money are supposed to come from abroad. Humanitarian aid, can hardly be delivered. So at least money can't go inside to guarantee, for example, certain rights for those who are in need, for those who are in poverty. It also will mean that in this situation, the online banking is also impossible. So Syrian people are left alongside inside of Syria and they are cut off 
of the financial system that limits the uh, right to work. It brings lots of them, so it doesn't help them to find a good work to provide their necessary living. It keeps them where they were, and it rises the inflation as well as a result. Therefore, the economic situation is deteriorating. I would like to draw attention here to the fact naturally sanctions is not the only reason for the bad economic situation in Syria, but that's one of the very serious reasons. And it's necessary to take it into account in order to guarantee rights of people of Syria. Right. And certainly, you see, it'd be awful enough for me to imagine living under this in a, in normal circumstances where, you know, where I live in New York, if my banking situation was impeded, uh, hospitals lacked medical equipment. But then you think about the fact that this comes after 10 years of war where a bunch of foreign countries were involved, including the U.S., which is now imposing these sanctions. And it's just hard to fathom the impact of trying to not only live under these conditions to begin with, but live under them while you're trying to rebuild from a catastrophic decade-long war. Yes, indeed. That's one of the very serious problems, and that, that's why I'm calling for lifting sanctions. There are different means of peaceful settlement of international disputes. There are some sort of legal mechanism which can be used in this sphere. And moreover, I would like to recall the very fact that the UN Charter doesn't allow application of any unilateral sanctions. It entitled the UN Security Council to take decision on taking of any enforcement measures, including military one, in the situations of the breach of peace, threat to peace, and acts of aggression. From the point of international law, Countries are only allowed to take measures which do not violate their international obligations. And here I speak about the economic ones, about any sort of international treaties, and naturally international agreements like, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and, uh, Civil and Political Rights and International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. I'm absolutely aware that the United States is not a member of the latter one, but lots of the rights, including the right to health, right to food, right to work, as well as some other of them, have already become a customer, customary norms of international law, and they all are set in Universal Declaration for Human Rights. Another point which is very important to take into account is that even um, after the decade of sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council in 1990s, there was an enormous work done within the United Nations which identified that humanitarian impact of those absolutely legal sanctions has also been enormous. And therefore, the UN Security Council started to apply targeted sanctions as a result of that. And if you compare the scope of sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council and the United States of America today, the difference is enormous. Therefore, I always call to use the rules which already exist in international law. And moreover, I always call not to forget about the principle of humanity. People shouldn't die, people shouldn't suffer, and people shouldn't think whether they can survive up to tomorrow because they have neither medicine or food because of the sanctions applied, as well as because of any other reasons. In accordance with international law, every country is under obligations to act under international law first and to observe human rights second, regardless whether the state acts inside of the state or outside of the state. In your discussions with humanitarian workers and experts, what are some of the main concerns uh, of theirs that stick out to you? Well, generally speaking, they mentioned several of them, and uh, the very first one was a very complicated character of their work. Due to the multi-layered character of sanctions, especially when we speak about Syria, we speak about the U.S. sanctions, European Union sanctions, uh, some other state sanctions, quite often they do not even know where they shall apply for humanitarian uh, licenses, uh, or maybe they shall apply to all the places. 
Secondly, they mentioned the very fact that donors are very concerned that, for example, they are ready to support function of the organization, but they are scared that their money will go to the country, which is under sanctions, for example, of the United States, and they need to differentiate how to use the funds received from different parts of the world. The third point they uh, uh, named was basically the fact that all the uh, sanctioning countries or groups of sanctions lay a burden of proof on the uh, humanitarian organization themselves. We need to take into account that not all of them are enormous and huge. Some of them are small, but they are still doing their humanitarian job and they are assisting people, including in Syria. And in this situation, the humanitarian organizations have to take responsibility and to prove and to guarantee that the humanitarian aid has genuine humanitarian purpose. Even, for example, when we speak about the delivery of medical equipment, because if you look, for example, at the guidances developed by the European Union, it said that, generally speaking, medical equipment can be sold at the uh, black market afterwards and also be used for corruption. So the humanitarian organization shall prove humanitarian purpose, shall do some steps to guarantee that it won't be used for some wrong purposes. And naturally, they are nervous. They do not know where to go. They do not know whom to contact. They have to prepare reports for everyone, for sanctioning states, for banks. They lose money because of the increasing rates of bank transfers. In some situation, the cost of bank transfer rise up to 10%, not like 0 0.2, 0 0.5 we used to have. Um, moreover, the duration of the consideration of banks for any bank transfers is increasing. For example, when we speak about the transfer of money to Venezuela, the banks uh, may consider the situation up to 45 days. That's not like transferring money within the day or the next day, as we used to have. Moreover, uh, the, say, uh, the main reason and the main aspect, all of them are mentioned, is that they are scared. They are scared for their own functioning to be listed. They are scared for their personnel to be listed for delivering humanitarian aid. They are scared that donors will be scared, and they already are, and that they will trans uh, provide less funds for any sort of humanitarian activity. That's why, for example, after that meeting, I uh, elaborated the guidance on delivery of humanitarian aid in December 2020 that did a press release, and the guidance itself is on the web page of the mandate. And I hope very much that the sanctioning countries will read it and we'll see the scope, so the accumulation of all the humanitarian concerns, as well as recommendations and hope that they will change their policy. And when it comes to the impact of these sanctions now, especially after a 10 year war, in the 1990s, the US imposed crippling sanctions on Iraq. And even though at that time there was this so-called oil for food program uh, facilitated by the UN in which Iraq could sell some oil in exchange for buying humanitarian goods, there was still a catastrophic impact of sanctions on the Iraqi people to the point where two UN coordinators for this program resigned, saying that the sanctions were essentially genocidal. Are we risking a similar situation or are we seeing a similar situation now with the sanctions on Syria? I'm afraid that my answer is yes, and uh, I will clarify a couple of points. Unfortunately, when, uh, as I have mentioned, the UN Security Council had to change its policy towards sanctions uh, because of the enormous humanitarian impact, not only on Iraq, but on all the states. And when I speak about the enormous humanitarian impact, I speak about the uh, hundreds, millions, percents of inflation the enormous increase of uh, deaths, including the maternal deaths, the deaths of newborn children. Um, there was a study done by a number of huge humanitarian NGOs in Iraq. And if I'm not mistaken, the number, uh, the, uh, number of uh, children beyond five, which died within 10 years was plus half a million because of the impossibility 
to get food, because of the possibility to get medical treatment, because of the impossibility of vaccination, as well as uh, malnutrition and dysentery all around. That's why I always insisted that the humanitarian precaution shall always be taken. That already turned to be a practice of the UN Security Council. And I believe it shall be a practice of every state. We have a similar principle in international environmental law under ESPA Convention, when the preliminary assessment of the possible impact in that case on the environment shall be made before any activity starts and in the course of the activity. The same, upon my opinion, shall be applied when we speak about international relations. Some activity, for example, as done by the UN Security Council, may be absolutely legal, but the humanitarian impact will be enormous. When we speak about the unilateral sanctions of states, the majority of them have no ground under international law, and their humanitarian impact is also enormous. We need to start about people and to start thinking about human rights. We can't protect human rights by violating human rights of those we seek to protect. And when you speak to humanitarian workers, in their view, uh, how does the impact of sanctions compare to the impact of the 10-year war on Syrian civilians? Well, generally speaking here, I can just repeat the words of one of them, although I do not pretend it to be like the uh, absolute truth because I do not know the answer. But one of them said, that today the impact of unilateral sanctions to Syrian population can be pretty equivalent to those of the conflict itself. They said that the conflict itself have affected like the huge percentage of the population, but sanctions affect the population as a whole. Finally, when People defend these sanctions, especially in the U.S. government and their allies. They say that there are humanitarian exemptions, and they also say that they are providing humanitarian aid to Syria. Does that make up for the impact of the sanctions? I need to say, first of all, that indeed some humanitarian aid is provided indeed. And in all my previous statements, I also always welcomed any sort of humanitarian aid which was or could be provided and as well as any sort of humanitarian assistance which is provided by anyone, states, international government organizations, no government organization, anyone else. But generally speaking, when we speak about the humanitarian aid, we need to take into account two aspects. The very first one is that it's not sufficient. Uh, some, as I said, humanitarian organizations face enormous problems in getting licenses for delivering of this humanitarian aid. Naturally, if that humanitarian aid wouldn't be delivered, more people would die because of starvation. More than today, or because of not having sufficient medicine. So naturally, it helps some people. At the same time, it's not sufficient. And the second point we need to take into account that in accordance to international law, that's a prior responsibility of a state to guarantee that the, its population is development and to satisfy its basic needs. If sanctions prevent, for example, reconstruction or functioning of the oil industry or doing rebuilding the medical infrastructure, buying medicine or buying medical goods, it means that country is prevented to do its duty to guarantee rights of that population. That's why I would say again, uh, it's good that some humanitarian aid de is delivered. From the other side, it's not sufficient. And moreover, um, making the population dependent entirely on the humanitarian aid upon my opinion, prevents the development of that population. We'll leave it there. Elena Dohan is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Negative Impact of Sanctions and a professor at Belarusian State University. Professor Dohan, thank you very much. Thank you.